Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00, and this is like take 12 of me trying to do coverage of Season 2, Episode 1, and Episode 2 of the Halo TV show. Uh, in my short I recently posted, I articulate the fact that I try to do a long-form, kind of most detailed breakdown-esque breakdown of the two respective episodes. Each video would have totaled about 50 minutes, um, and I hoped that the format and the way that I went about doing that video would mean that I wouldn't have to worry too much about copyright strikes and, and contents being blocked and things like that. Unfortunately, uh, through, like I said, about 11 or 12 different iterations, I just couldn't get past the fact that the video was being blocked in all territories. Uh, so I decided to, I felt like I was flogging a dead horse, I decided to completely kind of rethink the, the format and decided to do this instead. Uh, so this is not quite what I originally wanted, but I'll, I'll take inspiration and I'll, there's even a couple of excerpts from my original script that I'd like to read you uh, in regards to my thoughts on episode one and episode two of season two of the Halo TV show. Without anything further ado, let's get on with this and roll the intro. So on the whole, the response that I'm seeing across social media for Season 2 is very, very positive. Uh, there's still a few people that are, are, are kind of singing the same tune and still levying arguments about Season 1 and how that's completely put them off of Season 2. Completely get it. Completely valid arguments. It's, it's all good. But on the whole, I'm seeing much more positivity surrounding Season 2 uh, than we saw for Season 1 which is great that's that's a really good response to be seeing and it only bodes well for the long-term success of the franchise as a whole and this is an argument i've made quite a few times uh, in that all the, the the tv show becoming a success as i truly hope that it does i really hope that as as we go through into season three and that's like maybe the the, the first half of halo ce and then halo 4 is like from the flood levels onwards and i really hope this escalates as we progress and the TV show becomes really something big. Uh, because that only means good things for the franchise as a whole. We all love Halo. And we all want Halo to do as good as it can possibly do. Because as long as it shows that it's a marketable product, which uh, from a business point of view, it has to be, uh, and people are consuming that content, that's only going to tell the big corporate giants and the higher-ups that this is a franchise that people care about and to keep producing content for it. So the more TV show series we get, the more chance we have of maybe having a full-length full, full -length feature film being made, the more chance we have of more games, more spin-off games, more content in general. It just means good things for the overall health of the franchise. So to see as positive a response as we're getting for Season 2 as we are getting really fills me with with some some sincere optimism for the future of the franchise which is great uh, so that's kind of an overarching feel of what's been going on since the launch of season two i'll say at the get-go season one on the whole i really enjoyed i know it wasn't for everyone i know a lot of people really did not like it i completely get it there are still aspects of season one i wasn't particularly keen on i didn't particularly feel much about soren's storyline it was an interesting kind of side story, but not a lot really happened with it. I wasn't particularly interested in Quan's storyline because it felt circular and it didn't really feed into the mainline narrative and it didn't really go anywhere. And a few other a few other aspects of, of a few other things, for example, the sex scenes felt superfluous. And yeah, a few things in general for season one I didn't like, but on the whole, I, I was able to kind of ignore that, shift it aside, and focus on things I really did like. And there, there was a lot to like for season one. Season two, on the other hand, there's been a significant shift in the tone and the grittiness and the groundedness of what we're seeing, not just in the storytelling, not just in the writing, not just in the dialogue, but also in the way that scenes are shot, the storytelling that's done through the environment and through the body language of the actors, uh, the storytelling that's done through uh, through the, the camera and the fact that it, most of the shots seem to be like almost handheld, so it gets you in with the action, so to speak, rather than done, done with a, like a long lens and just zoomed in. It's a wide lens and really close up. It really makes you feel like you're in that moment with them. The way that this has been done in, in Season 2 so far is much more in line with what I would say is a quintessentially Halo experience and none more so than the opening introduction of Episode 1. 
uh, that sequence, the first 15 minute sequence thereabouts, until we get the actual f title screen, which in and of itself is glorious because it's got a reimagining of the Halo 2 theme, uh, but with new arrangements and, and, and new compositions layered over the top of it is truly glorious. But that first 15 minutes, that sequence of events that Chief is undertaking on Sanctuary is glorious. And the, the response I'm seeing pretty much across the board is that people are loving what they're seeing in that opening 15 minutes. And rightly so. The opening scene showcases Silver Team doing not necessarily what they do best. They're providing overwatch for evacuation uh, efforts on the planet of Sanctuary. But when Chief and Riz get involved, you can see the way that other people react to the presence of the Spartans. And they're treated with almost some degree of reverence and a modicum of almost fear. The physicality and the prowess of the Spartans and how powerful they are are translated through more organic motions and more organic methods as opposed to just having scenes that are kind of dedicated to showing off, so to speak, how powerful Spartans can be. It's done in a more natural sense in the same way that, say, uh, the Starry Night trailer was for Halo 3 where Chief just stands up from being knocked down, puts his helmet on, says two words, throws a bubble shield, runs, and then jumps. There's not a lot that really happens there, but in that trailer, it tells you everything you need to know about the personality of the Chief and who he is and what he's about. And that's mirrored really, really nicely in some of these scenes in this opening sequence of the first 15 minutes of episode one, which is fantastic to see. The use of environmental storytelling with the uh, with the fog and and keeping the enemies occluded beyond the fog and the, and the kind of hit and run strategies that the elites have is really nice. It's it's the same kind of level of environmental storytelling that Bungie mastered back in the day, particularly for the level uh, 343 Guilty Spark in the swamp, where the flood enemies and the, the quote-unquote friendly pings on the IFF transponder were just beyond your vision. You'd see something move in the distance, but you couldn't quite tell what it was. Uh, that use of environmental storytelling is almost being mirrored one-to-one -one in this sequence of events. Uh, on Sanctuary around the relay. And even the choice to do a specific sequence of events in what approximates uh, a single running shot. I, I think there are actually like hidden cuts. I think I've picked up on a couple of hidden cuts, but they're done so perfectly that it's actually difficult to track. But it means that you get a single continuous shot, which gives you a clear broadcast and almost storyline of the series of events in real time, engagement after engagement. And again, Chief's battle prowess, his competency in um, in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and just how lethal and dangerous he is, is broadcast clearly in the way in which he engages in combat with the elites, including sort of throwing one off and then very rapidly closing that distance and getting up on top of them. He uses leverage, he uses body position, he uses domination to his advantage, and he's just quick, clean, and efficient. All of his movements are exact, there's nothing superfluous, he doesn't pull punches, he's just efficient and lethal as he should be and that opening combat scene uh, culminates in being almost surrounded by elites as they engage their energy swords with a character i assume is the arbiter but not the arbiter we know from the games the arbiter we know for, from the games was crowned after the events of halo ce this could be an arbiter that is b the arbiter before fell vadam and ultimately, these elites are called off, and I'm inclined to believe they're called off by that leader, and the elites very quickly retreat. And then we get a very brief scene that looks like McKee as she turns and walks away. I don't think that's actually McKee. I think actually Chief is almost to a degree seeing things, uh, because she turns and walks away to the exact location that is hit by a glassing beam seconds later. If she was actually there she'd be dead for the rest of the season. So that wouldn't, but well, then again, I thought she was dead at the end of season one. And here we are. <laughs> and it doesn't seem particularly unusual to me that the elites would retreat and try to get clear of the glassing beam and maybe some of them are caught by the glassing beam, I don't know. Because we know that really when, the co when it comes down to things, the Covenant really don't care about glassing a planet with their soldiers on the surface it's really not that high of a concern for them. They've got so many soldiers in reserve that they can just be replenished. So an individual foot soldier isn't really valued particularly high. And any of the soldiers that are caught on the surface that die in the process believe they're going on their great journey. So there's no real loss for the Covenant. But I will say the series of events that happen in, in those it is only really over the span of a few seconds. I think there is just about enough time for the elites to get clear of the exact area that the glassing beam strikes down uh, and then probably get extracted there afterwards, hence why we see that particular arbiter later on. And by later on, I mean in 
the second episode. So at this stage, I'm confused as to whether or not Makia is actually back in the fold as an active character, or if she's going to be more like a kind of a PTSD flashback kind of character that's kind of quote unquote haunting the chief um, for the first few episodes, or maybe through this entire series. If that is how it's going to go, I'm not exactly sure how I feel about that. Um, again, wasn't a huge fan of the romance scene, and funnily enough, neither was Pablo. I know there were there were articles out about it uh, a while ago, and I know I made a video about it a while ago, speaking about the sex scene and the romance scene between uh, Chief and McKee, and that Pablo himself was actually against it. And of course, I don't trust a lot of those uh, a lot of the news articles that report on that stuff because very often things can be misquoted. Quotes can be taken out of context, and and so, some articles can just be outright lies. So I don't always believe the articles. So in that circumstance, I did actually go directly to him and asked him if he could confirm that he did in fact say uh, that he wasn't he, he he didn't like the idea that the 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 romance and the sex scene that happened between uh, Chief and McKee. And he came back and said that it is correct. Uh, there are many things that I pushed back against uh, in season one and was overruled. Uh, it wasn't just the sex. I didn't feel the nature of the relationship should have been romantic at all. Mysterious, maybe, magnetic for sure, but not romantic. So that's great to know that, that, that as an actor, he didn't feel like that's the direction it should have gone. But of course, in season one, he was, after all, just the actor. And the writers and the showrunner and the directors made the choice to ignore his opinions on the subject and went in the direction that they wanted to. It's just how the chips fell, unfortunately. In either case, moving on from McKee, uh, next, the glassing beam struck the surface, and it is glorious to see a planet being glassed. I know that's a weird thing to say, but the, the speed at which these glassing beams render rock into lava is just staggeringly fast. And you can actually do some calculations to find out uh, the energies that are involved in there. So there will be a video chasing up to this, which will be the physics of the glassing beam. So look forward to that. Seeing condors just getting glassed out of the air as well is just fantastic in either case chief does what chief does best and he protects uh corporal perez which i think is a callback to halo 2 because there's a there's a corporal perez in in halo 2 as well uh who leads chief to sergeant banks uh at the command post but in either case chief protects perez with his body actually body blocks her from the blast because it is very close it hits the top of the mountain i think wipes out the relay while it does it so he keeps really close to, uh, to Perez and, and keeps her safe. And then the next scenes, really, we see is, is extraction and then Chief arriving back on the ground for extraction, carrying Perez over his shoulder uh, and then loading her onto the condor. We get some brief scenes with some religious leaders uh, on, this, on this opening sequence. And we also get a lot of other conversations across both episodes on the subjects of belief and faith and i've got a few things to say about that but we'll, we'll come to that in a minute and again through the environmental storytelling and through body language you can see how she feels about the fact that he's leaving survivors so to speak on the planet to be glassed there's this lingering moment where he looks and you see the reflection of them in his visor uh, and he he's holding his gaze on them you can tell that he's not happy with the fact that there are humans that are being left behind but it was kind of their choice and again that wasn't the only instance where body language was telling a story when he was on top of the mountain with Perez, there were there was the moment where he was walking through after he kind of cleared the area to find Perez and he was coming across the bodies of dead Marines. And again, the body language was really only from his knees down, but you could see he was hesitating, he was turning, he was looking at the bodies of the Marines. There was he was slowing down in his strides, which means he was taking on board the fact that he had lost fellow soldiers right there and he was unable to save them. Oh, and just quickly before we move on, the really brief shot of him like twitch response, like shooting over his shoulder the shotgun and blasting the elite's head off. Fantastic. <laughs> In either case, at the end of this sequence of events, the Condor's door finally closes, and then, and only then, do we get the helmet removal. Uh, and Chief's expression says it all. He's not particularly happy about the events that have just played out, and he, it's things don't seem right. And while we're on the subject of helmet removal, I know that's still a problem for people. I know that the idea of removing his helmet is a problem. I know the idea of, of him removing his armor is still a problem. But he has removed his helmet a lot in the extended law. He has removed all of his armor, even when it's not necessarily safe to do so in the extended law. I mean, he did that in Halo the Flood. He removed his entire armor and had a shower on Installation 04, Alpha Base. Installation 04 being an alien ring world. He's surrounded by Covenant forces. The Flood are on the ring somewhere, and he doesn't know that at that point. But in either case, it wasn't a safe environment, so to speak. But he had a shower. So I know that people don't like the fact that he removes his helmet and removes his armor. But really, when you consider things, 
this is an alternate timeline. This is a completely separate quote unquote universe almost. So even though he removes his helmet or his armor in the TV show, that doesn't change the enjoyment that we have in the books. That doesn't change the enjoyment that we have in the games. It doesn't change either of those just because the TV show does something a little bit different. So I feel like if you are able to kind of put that on the side and think, okay, this is different. They take the helmet off, they take the armor off, just put it aside and, you know, I'll focus on what else is going on. I feel like if you can do that, you may find more enjoyment with season two uh, than if you kind of struggle to get past that. It's just my opinion on that. Take it or leave it. Moving on from that, the next scenes we get is Ackerson's introduction. And he is he's, he's, he's somewhat of an antagonist, but he's still fighting for humanity. He's still fighting the covenant. So he, he's not he's less an antagonist and more of an anti-hero. He's he's in line with his role in the books in that he is kind of the answer to Dr. Halsey, but goes about the same problem with very different methods. Uh, and these methods just so happen to stand in opposition to the Spartan Twos. And the scenes between Ackerson and Chief in particular and their, and their conversations and how tense it is are an absolute treat. Like I say, if you struggle to get past the fact that he removes his helmet or his armor, the, the, the scenes between Ackerson and Chief play out obviously they're going to play out a high com on reach where it's safe where chief won't be wearing his armor the scenes between the two of them the chemistry that's on that's on screen and just how tense and engaging and immersive though those interactions are are an absolute treat to look forward to and i found myself looking forward to the moments where chief isn't wearing his armor and having these conversations with Ackerson just as much as i look forward to the scenes that we had say at the opening of episode one where chief was just blasting through the covenant it's fantastic. And while we're on the subject, Pablo has actually come out and clarified uh, some some quotes that he's, he's put out before that have been either misunderstood or misquoted before, uh, in that he actually loves acting with the helmet on, um, and he understands how valuable it is to have the helmet on uh, to articulate body language and, and the, the stoicism of the chief as he as he demonstrates in the opening sequence, particularly when he's talking to, well, I say talking to, when he's interacting with the religious leader, he doesn't say a word. She's talking to him and he just stares back at her, just as Chief, the Chief we know would. Going back to Ackerson, the actor who plays Ackerson, Joseph Morgan, is actually a long-time fan of Halo as well. He's played all of the games. He's one of us. He's, he's one of the nerds that have gone through and played all the campaigns, understands the storyline. He even went back and played uh, Halo Reach because obviously he's dealing with the fall of Reach once more before actually starting acting on the show, so he had it fresh in his memory as he went into it. And I think Again, I think we can all agree that Ackerson's portrayal in the TV series so far, fantastic. I think that's literally like the takeaway word for, for my review so far, it's just fantastic. I also note that they're making quite a lot of effort to articulate how uh, uncomfortable the Spartans feel around others. Less about how, the, how uncomfortable the Spartans feel around themselves, because when they're in their own tight-knit little tight -knit little groups, when they're in the Spartan barracks and they're talking to Cobalt team, they're, they're comfortable. You can tell they're comfortable. But the scenes when they're not wearing their armor, for example, when Chief was talking to Axon in his office, you can tell Chief isn't comfortable being around other human beings, like just normal human beings or normal civilians or just other military personnel. He's not comfortable. And even, you know, he stood there at ease. It's not very, very at ease. You can still see it's, it's more or less at attention. And Axon tries to get him to Rax, and you can see he just doesn't want to. And the, 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 the unease and the discomfort that the Spartans feel is, is amplified by the way in which other people respond to the presence of the Spartans. Opening scene, you get Marines giving these, these behemoths where he looks. When Chief arrives on the kind of only level of Highcom, the receptionist at the desk gives him a really wary look. This is a two meter tall Spartan with big muscles. They move differently. The, 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 even the use of costume with the, the you know, sleeveless shirts and stuff like that, showing off large muscles and the scars of the laser incision vectors for the augmentation, clearly broadcasts that Spartans are very different from normal human beings, even when they're not in their armor. And I think these themes uh, are being brought up because they're trying to push this idea that um, that most of the people who are in opposition to John and the Spartan program think of Master Chief and John as two different people and really Master Chief is just a guy in a suit. And I think the overarching redemption storyline for that is that Chief knows that he's more than that. He's more than just a dude in a suit and showing him out of armor being able to still do superhuman feats, which I'm sure we'll see in upcoming episodes clearly broadcast that the man inside the suit is just as exceptional 
as the suit itself. And I think also plays into these tropes of belief and faith, not necessarily in a, in a religious context, but Chief's faith in his, in, in his own capabilities, Chief's belief in his own capabilities, and the fact that gradually, particularly in the year 2552, that's a, that's a pivotal moment for the Master Chief. He goes from just being a legendary warrior to humanity's saviour, or, or an almost pseudo-religious role, so to speak, and is treated with huge reverence. And I think that's all, the, 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 these themes of belief and faith are not just in Chief's ability to understand what and who he truly is, but also how humanity will eventually respond to him. We also get, obviously, a really nice look into the Office of Naval Intelligence in a much darker and more visceral way than we got with the entirety of Season 1. Obviously, Ackerson is kind of not the head of the Office of Naval Intelligence, but he's, he's up there. And the way he reacts is much more in line with an Oni spook. It's things, things don't sit right with him. You can't always read him fully. There's almost narcissism at work, and he seems to be masking his intentions and his emotions very well. And you even get a look at some of Oni's propaganda and their manipulation of mass media in the ceremony, the award ceremony for Perez, in that the events weren't retold accurately. They, they put Perez forward as being a something of an, a, an unexpected would-be hero, when in reality, you know, Chief pretty much fought that fight for her and she was led on the floor for most of it with respect. And also the fact that they're manipulating the actual video feeds in that the, the award ceremony itself has maybe about 64-ish attendees and the tarmac and the hangar are pretty much empty. And yet in the broadcasted footage that Chief and Silver Team are watching in the barracks clearly shows that the, the, the tarmac has got like eight huge condors on it and there's there's at least double the quantity of attendees at the ceremony, and even beyond that, behind the podium, there's nearly a filled battalion of soldiers. And that's all been kind of almost rendered in by the Office of Naval Intelligence to control the mass media, to broadcast a completely different series of events, to make things out like the war is going significantly better than it actually is, which is something they do in the mainline canon. The whole idea behind that is that if they make things out to be better than they really are, people are more likely to keep fighting on the front lines and more people are likely to enlist to be like the Spartans. When in reality, if they'd actually told the true story, no one would want to fight, everybody would just want to run. <laughs> Capri scream. And speaking on the Office of Naval Intelligence, we get uh, the shots of Parangoski, who is now no longer an admiral, as she's, I suppose, been a fool guy for everything that went wrong in Season 1. So um, she's no longer in... <laughs> she's no longer Cinconi, the commander in chief of the Office of Naval Intelligence. But the thing is, is that she feels more like the commander in chief of the Office of Naval Intelligence in this very short scene in the elevator than she ever felt in the entirety of season one. Because the thing with season one was is that most of it felt like she was kind of just there as a passenger to her, her actual role, and that Halsey was manipulating her and controlling her for most of the narrative, and was just bodying Parangoski. Parangoski is not a person you can just body in the mainline law. She's the kind of person that arranges to have you chopped up into small cubes and make it look like a suicide. That's what kind of woman she is. So the fact that she's gathering intelligence, and she evidently knew Chief was going to be in that elevator at that time, because if she didn't, then Chief wouldn't have been surprised to see her. And the fact that she's still gathering intelligence on what's happening with the, with the war, and what's happening with Ackerson, and all the different threads of narrative that are going on there, she is inevitably going to seize back control and seize back the glorious throne of Cinconi once more. Mark my words, it's on the cards. <laughs> Chief is also evidently struggling about how he feels internally, particularly in regards to Cortana. It's evident based on the fact that he slipped up on a few words and the fact that he goes to, I think it's like a virtual brothel, or something. I'm not exactly sure what I'm seeing there because there's no real context on what this thing. Because it's within an arcade. Why would you have a brothel within an arcade? I don't. It just. It doesn't. It doesn't feel right that it's a brothel. It should maybe be something. I'm not sure. In either case, that's that's aside from the point. The point is, is that he has personified or at least thinks of Cortana in a personal manner, which is actually quite a big leap considering that in season one, most of their relationship was strained at best but of course towards the end of season one they bonded over a very traumatic series of events they bonded over battle and the significance of a relationship like that cannot be understated you can ask any veteran in the world and they'll tell you exactly the same thing that their brothers and sisters in arms who saw combat with them are some of the closest human beings to them in the world 
So the fact that Chief bonded with Cortana in those closing moments is not surprising. And to be fair, even in the mainline canon, Chief actually responded to Cortana more like she was a piece of equipment or hardware and kind of almost partially ignored her advice and her guidance when they when they first were partnered up to go through the, the, the trial. That actually, Ackerson played a hand in almost killing Chief. And it was because of Ackerson playing that role that Cortana and Chief had to work together to both survive that incident, which galvanized their relationship into what it ultimately became. So I do actually wonder, I, I, that's... I do wonder now if maybe that's a reason why in episode two it's revealed that Ackerson has got Halsey and Cortana. Maybe Ackerson's role is going to be similar to in the books and he influences things behind the scenes and nearly kills Chief, but Cortana's there to help out and again that's what galvanises it. Interesting. I'll think on that. And quickly, when speaking on that scene with the brothel-esque thing inside the arcade, on the door of the booth that he enters uh, are the words Fate, then followed by the numbers 52, which makes me wonder perhaps maybe that's a nod to Chief achieving his fate as humanity's saviour in the year of 2552, because it is really the year of 2552 that Chief galvanises himself from being just the best Spartan and and a hell of a warrior to the saviour of humanity. And just below that are the numbers 2589 and the letters L-O-R. Now, 2589, 2589 sprang out to me because it's the date that shows on the epilogue cutscene of Halo Reach when Reach is being recolonized. And L-O-R jumped out to me because we often abbreviate the name of the book, The Fall of Reach, to F-O-R. So in this regard, and in relation to 2589 being the year that we see Reach being recolonized after being terraformed, could L-O-R stand for Life of Reach? I don't know. It might be a little Easter egg. I might be just reading it too far into it, but I just thought, interesting to note, I thought I'd mention it. Next, as I said originally, I wasn't particularly interested in Soren's storyline as a whole, but there was a specific scene, particularly the scene between Soren and his son Kessler, where they were talking about monsters not being real. When I saw that scene, and particularly in my analysis of it for the longer video that ultimately never was, um, I actually realised there were levels of dialogue that were happening in that scene, and, and, and at least two or three levels of metaphor that could be drawn from the conversation. That has actually made it one of my favourite scenes for episode one. And if you'd allow me, I'd like to read a small passage of the original script that was the 50-minute really deep dive into episode one. I just want to read a small part in reference to Soren and his son's conversation. Let's move it over here. So I assessed this scene and I came up with this. The dialogue between Soren and Kessler during this scene speaks on monsters, and I believe this is two or at least threefold. It's monsters in the literal sense when considering the Covenant. They are the literal monster, the unfeeling emotionless beast coming to reap destruction and bloodshed. But the specific phrases Soren chooses to use to speak to his son of the monsters that come in the night, take children from their beds and steal their souls, can be directly tied to two parts of the narrative simultaneously in metaphor. The obvious metaphorical reference is that of the Spartans. The rubble is a human colony that is populated by overwhelming majority by pirates, criminals, rebels and insurrectionists, all of whom tell stories to their children about the dreaded Spartans, particularly in reference to the mission against Colonel Robert Watts. But the slightly less obvious metaphorical reference is that of the Office of Naval Intelligence themselves. Soren has direct living experience of this particular metaphorical monster. Dr. Halsey, in his eyes, represents the embodiment of the monster that comes in the night, takes children from their beds, and steals their souls. Soren was just one such child. He was kidnapped by the Office of Naval Intelligence for Dr. Halsey's Spartan 2 program when he was six years old. They likely came in the night. They likely sedated his parents so they could perform their work uninterrupted. They would then take the child from their bed and replace them with a rapidly glowing flash clone, which could arguably be another child that has no soul. They're then taken into the Spartan program where they are physically torn apart and opened up to be augmented for the Spartan program. And then they're given the hormone regulator chip in the base of their spine, which arguably steals their souls. And what's even more interesting is that onwards from that, they become the very monsters that the rebels tell their children about. So that particular scene actually had levels of dialogue, which was actually quite thrilling to realise as I was going through and and, and analysing that particular scene. Or even the fact that Soren refused to swear on his son's life that monsters don't exist, and then when pressed, decides to disengage from the conversation entirely and just walk away, clearly translates to both Kessler and us as the viewer that Soren knows well and good that monsters do exist, because he's about to depart on a mission to go and get one. 
We once again get a swelling of the music towards the end of the episode and the music is absolutely divine and just sets the pace and the tone of what's going on as well as bringing in the other different narratives that are going on simultaneously and folding them together suggesting that all of these storylines in one way or another are going to feed into each other and become significant towards perhaps the end of season two start of season three. That's great to see. And then we get the reveal of Quan. Now again, Quan's storyline is probably my least liked storyline of both seasons so far. However, in this cutscene, there are constellations on the ceiling and the eyes and more of a monster. Now, it's easy to draw the conclusions that perhaps this monster is the Covenant Empire. It's, it's an avatar for the Covenant Empire because there are some constellations or some stars behind where the monster is quote-unquote looking that seem like they've almost been crossed out, like they've been glassed or, you know, taken over. That could easily be drawn that the monster that we're seeing here is the Covenant. I wonder, however, due to her influence... I wonder, however, due to her storyline from the first season in the there's something of a guardian to that well or portal to maybe not a halo but just a foreigner installation of some description and there evidently being evidence of some degree of a gene song at work and there's a six month gap between the events of season one and season two has Quan inadvertently learned more about what her true purpose is and maybe on a subconscious level is preempting the flood but it's a threat so far down the line that it's not the immediate threat of the covenant that's in our face so we're just not prepared for it and because it's still subconscious to her she's not really putting one and one together and realizing what the threat is i i don't know i may be just again drawing too much from that but in either case the fact that there seems to be some deeper influences going on here in regards to the gene song or her status as a as a pseudo reclaimer actually suddenly makes Quan's storyline a little bit more interesting to the long-term deep lore narrative for the TV show. And that was something fully unexpected. Overall, my thoughts on episode one, on the whole, I think the takeaway word is fantastic. Uh, there's a few things that feel a little bit at odds, really, with um, with the overall narrative. I understand why they were done. So, for example, the things that were happening on the rubble with the, like what effectively is a slave trade. Uh, felt a bit disjointed and a bit too almost comedic or, or jovial. Um, there are overarching tones of, of doom because of the glass colonies and, and, and with Felix being there and speaking his story about, uh, about Harvest, as we all well know. But um, yeah, there were aspects of it that still just felt a little at odds, but on the whole, huge, huge, huge improvement over, um, over the discrepancies that we were having in season one and the grittiness, the groundedness, um, the combat scenes just feel so quintessentially Halo, and I, I my my opinion on that is shared, broadly speaking, by a huge quantity of people, which is, again, great to see. So that's episode one, and this video is actually running on a little longer than I was first expecting it to, so I actually might round this out here as being the first video look at episode one, and we'll do a completely separate video for episode two. Let me know if you like this kind of format. If it felt a little bit rambly, I apologize. This is not what I originally wanted to do for this particular type of coverage. But I thought I wanted to give you guys something. I wanted to give you my opinion on things that were going on. And this seemed like the most organic and genuine way to do it. Um, so leave your comments down below. Tell me what you thought of the first episode. Uh, tell me what you thought of the kind of this format of, of giving you information on and my opinions on things. And I will see you for the next video for episode two. And until next time, I'm not just going to leave it half a year. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider smashing the like button and leave a comment below on what you'd like me to cover next. Big shout out to my patrons Spartan10148, the Metarch of my installation, Falcon, Prophet Bear, Mikhail, Sophia, and Ashley, my dutiful monitors, Darian, Scarab, Spartan0137, Anthony, Ghost, Aaron, Chris, Jacob, Sean, Element0, Somatic, Jordan J3, Dan, Mr. Keys, Directal, Gunslinger, Jacob, Bandmill, Echo, Evermore, Officer Cat, and Personal Devil, my diligent submonitors, my fleet of Strato Sentinels, and my loyal enforcers. And all the other patrons who have jumped aboard to support the channel, it means more to me than I can accurately put into words. Another shout out to my Tier 0 Transcendent YouTube members, Spartan137, Jacob, Schmitty, Talia, Fenrir and Born Stella. And all the other YouTube members, keeping my installation running on that glorious vacuum energy. Shout out to John for, I don't fucking know. And if you want more of this kind of content, hit the subscribe button and the little bell icon so you don't miss any future videos. And consider jumping aboard yourself as a patron or YouTube member to keep the channel alive and kicking. Thanks again for watching. Take it easy, everyone.
and find peace in the domain. <laughs>